I think to me, good garbage continues to provide. Hello, hello. Welcome to the Good Garbage Podcast. My name is Veth Krishna. My primary reason for existence has been to find ways to leave our wonderful planet cleaner. We will be speaking with material innovators, creators and propagators to learn from them how we can build for scale and towards a regenerated future. Their stories will help us answer the big question, what is good garbage? We are in a relatively nascent industry and in order to create an impact, we need to have the kind of visibility that is needed. And for that, policy advisory or advocacy becomes really important. Plant-Based Products Council is one organization that is working towards this purpose. Uh, Jessica, its executive director, has a strong legal and ecological background. I hope that you enjoy this conversation. So happy to have Jessica Bowman today, who is the executive director of Plant-Based Products Council. And uh, so it's going to be very exciting to learn from you. And of course, reading your background has been so exciting. So thank you so much for taking the time. Yeah, I appreciate it. I'm happy to be here. I think this is my first podcast, so very exciting. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. That's wonderful. We're going to have fun. So, so I'm going to start with Jessica, the person you know, early childhood memories, which enabled you to get into sustainability. Uh, so it'll be interesting to know where you grew up and why this, what what influenced this direction. Sure. So I grew up in a, a very rural part of Pennsylvania um, in a small town. And when I grew up, we didn't have a lot of resources. So we spent a lot of time outside. Our recreation was doing things like hiking or camping. And those were family vacations for us was camping a lot. So, you know, being out in the outdoors and, you know, enjoying that. The, the area where I grew up is really known for outdoors. Um on the edge of the Allegheny National Forest. So there's a lot of outdoor recreation, hiking. Um, there's a reservoir there, so boating, mountain biking, things like that. So there's a lot of a lot of people spending spending time outside. And so that, um, I guess, was some of my initial sort of interest in the environment. And then I went to college at Penn State in Pennsylvania and majored in geoenvironmental engineering. So I liked math. So, <laughs> so uh, the, the engineering aspect was interesting to me. Although I will say this, I first went to college thinking I wanted to major in forestry, but there wasn't enough math. So I changed to engineering. <laughs> and then I, I, I think sort of was interested in how, how policy could really help and like regulations could help kind of support the things that you know, or needed to to be done from the environment. And so that sort of piqued my interest in law school and going to school to study environmental law. So, uh, but now doing the sort of policy aspects of things and, and, you know, seeing the opportunity to work with a broader industry, um, that's sort of how I got into working for a trade association. And so working with a broader industry to help impact policy that can have a broader change um, not just at a company level, but at a whole industry level, and really helping to drive, you know, change. So I've worked my whole career for associations. I worked for the American Chemistry Council a couple of times, and so the chemical industry and and sort of looking at how um, science can help support what's necessary to ensure chemicals are regulated appropriately, et cetera. Um, And I also worked for the aviation industry, which I loved that job. Um, I worked on environmental issues for them too. So really seeing, you know, the impacts that aviation has and how those can be mitigated on the impacts on water quality, on air quality, even some waste aspects. That was really an, an interesting, an interesting position. And all of this sort of leading me to where I am now as executive director of the Plant-Based Products Council and seeing this was a new organization that had just been set up and I saw the job posting, I thought that's perfect. That's perfect. I'm um, getting in, you know, this industry, I think really having an opportunity to to make a significant impact, but it's sort of not well known. And so um, helping to get the word out. So it's coming in at kind of the groundish level to help grow this industry and an industry that can have a a significant impact on improving the environment. Super. So that's wonderful. It's a great place um, that you took us to. So I would love to learn more about Plant-Based Products Council, how it came about, who started it, why did they start it, and then how did they manage to rope you in? 
Yeah, so the Plant-Based Products Council actually has kind of an interesting history in how it was set up. It was actually started by the Corn Refiners Association. So the Corn Refiners Association represents 100% of the corn wet milling industry in the U.S. And so that's sort of taking dent corn, the sort of, I don't know, I grew up calling it cow corn or field corn. Um, It's not the corn on the cob like you eat. And breaking it down to its kind of component parts, which are then used for all sorts of different things from food ingredients, animal feed, fuels, there's all sorts of different things that corn can be used for. But one area of opportunity was the use of of corn to make bioproducts. And seeing this real interest out there in bio-based products, more sustainable products, um, thought, well, this is, you know, an area that we should explore more. This creates, you know, new new market opportunities for the farmers that are providing us with this corn and, and you know, new business opportunities. So thinking about, about that. So CRA set up the Plant-Based Products Council as a totally separate organization that's not just focused on corn, but really seeing the opportunity for the broader plant-based industry. Yeah, so I came on board. And the organization is is really focused on a couple of things. One is, of course, policy. You know, we want to create a policy environment that helps support growth of this industry that really recognizes the benefits of plant-based products, but also education. Even I didn't really know what plant-based products were before I started. I remember being at a, a pot belly, like a you know fast food kind of restaurant in DC, kind of near where I work now, before I started and looking at this straw and it was labeled as compostable. And I was like, well, that's that sounds great. I don't know what that means, but that sounds great. <laughs> now I know what that means. But at the time I just thought, well, this is positive, but I don't know what it means. And a lot of people don't. They don't know like, well, what is that made out of and what can I do with it? And so to help educate stakeholders, if it's consumers or policymakers in particular about what these products are, the benefits that they can provide. So we have now 36 member companies, and there are really a lot of different perspectives that that entails. So we, of course, have some of those, those corn refiner members, but we have a lot of other companies that, and are using different, different kind of inputs or feedstocks as well. We have companies that use seaweed to make plastics. We have companies in the hemp space. We have companies that, that grow sort of unique grasses that have beneficial properties in different applications and in different applications too. So companies that are you know, in the bioplastic space that maybe make bioplastic resins, packaging converters, all the way down to like PepsiCo is one of our members. So more sort of consumer facing. So we have all these different perspectives, but all with this general goal of how can we create a more circular economy by using more renewable inputs to make so many of the products that we use every day. And there's a lot of opportunity. We talk a lot about you know, I feel like there's a lot of more knowledge and we've done some consumer re- research that really shows people who are aware of these products think about single use items like single use disposable food service wear or packaging. But there's so many other applications too, even in more durable goods like car parts or furniture, things like that, that are going to last a, l- a long time. So trying to kind of get the word out about what what all of these products are and the opportunities to use more renewable inputs and so many of the things that we use every day. And is there a certain like a majority of focus? Is it more packaging focused? It could be more, like you said, durables. It could be FMCG. Is there a certain focus or is the majority of the companies that are members from a certain domain? I mean, if I had to categorize them, I'd say we probably have a stronger interest in like bioplastics and packaging, but that's not, we're not exclusive to that. So that's just maybe where I think there's a lot of interest because there's so much, I think there's a lot of attention on packaging and plastics right now in general, just sort of a growth in the concern about plastic and plastic pollution, that that's sort of a, an area that Plastics are, you know, they're they're not going away, but how can we make them better? Um, we could certainly probably use less of them, but for the ones that we do need, they provide really important properties from a, you know, food safety and, and, and so many other standpoints, but can we make them better? And that's where we kind of come in and say, hey, we, we don't need to make plastics out of petroleum. We can make them out of something renewable. And uh, when you when you look at plastics out of renewable, it could be compostable or not. From the council standpoint, is that something that you guys are particular about or it doesn't matter? Yeah. So one of the challenges we face is sort of addressing that misconception that 
that is out there that, well, it's bio-based, so it's biodegradable. And also this sort of biodegradable, compostable, people think that's the same thing when it's not the same thing. So sort of addressing some of that. But we certainly love to talk about the benefits of using something that is renewable. But as I kind of hinted at earlier, we also talk a lot about the circular economy. And to talk about the circular economy, you can't ignore the end of life for products. And you really should be thinking about it from the start. And so from our standpoint, we have been thinking about the end of life. I mean, you you hit the nail on the head, like all of these products aren't necessarily compostable. Some of them could be recyclable. So some of them, you can make a bio-based PET. So it performs identical to PET. It's just bio-based. But then you also have those more unique compostable products. And we talk a lot and we work with others like BPI. I know you you talk to Rhodes and some of our members in the compostable space. And that's an area that while there's a lot of focus on recycling and trying to, you know, fix the recycling system, there hasn't been as much sort of attention or love given to, to composting. And we see some real opportunity there. And so we've been working with BPI, U.S. Composting Council, and a number of other organizations to try to figure out how we can help support that industry so that those compostable products have a place to go. Now, I know there's lots of other challenges around, you know, composters' willingness to take compostable packaging and other products. But, you know, if we don't have the infrastructure, like, (laughs) you know, we need that to start with to even have a, a place to have the conversation. So that's one of the things we've been working on. We're located in Washington, D.C., so we're pretty focused on on federal policy, but trying to get some new funding opportunities for composting infrastructure so that we can continue to expand composting facilities, um, have more access to composting for not just, I mean, the packaging, yes, but also food waste and other organics and, and trying to get that stuff out of landfills. And I'm going to come back to composting because there's a whole list of things I want to know more in that section. But uh, staying with the applications, what are the ideas that have come to you recently that you are most point about and excited about that this may work or this may work at scale? What takes your fancy? Gosh, it's really hard to pick a favorite. (laughs) Your members may not be happy with this answer. (laughs) I love all of my members and all of their products. You know, I, I, I do think, well, you know, those unique applications and, and the unique properties are, I think, really interesting in some of the innovation that's happening. But I, th- I think there's also a lot of opportunity in those sort of drop-in products, because one of the challenges that you hear from, like, packaging companies, for example, is like, well, I need this to work in my system. I can't completely change all of my lines, and that's going to cost money, and I need to know that it will it will still keep my product safe and in the same quality that I'm expecting. So, I, you know, I do think there's that sort of drop in products. Um, opportunity is is a, a good place. You know, I, I do come back to those compostable products a lot. Like I, I think there's a lot of interest there. We're seeing a lot of, you know, brands sort of talking about compostable products and making more commitments there. But I think having the, the commitment through the life cycle, like it's great to say this is compostable, but we need it to be composted. So, you know, being supportive of getting it where it needs to go. So something that's just compostable in and of itself, we need to make sure that it can get where it needs to go along with what it's bringing with it that the composters want. So I don't know, it's hard to pick. I'm really interested too in those unique um, like inputs, like the seaweed, to see some of those innovations that are happening that are not as sort of top of mind. Like, you know, we have some members that are, are doing um, packaging and straws and different things out of, out of seaweed. And that's really exciting to see the diversity and innovation that's happening. Yeah, I, I managed to get Julia Marsh on my podcast. It was fun to learn more about how what Sway is doing. And I know they are members of yours as well. So, so yeah, it was fascinating to see what they're doing. But one thing that always intrigues me in terms of products is the size of the challenge is so large. Uh, from my standpoint, it, that in order to really make a dent, it has to be scalable and cost effective. So what do you think of when you think about products? And, you know, does that make sense to you? Absolutely, right. But this industry faces some challenges around both of those, around scaling and around cost, especially when we're usually competing with petroleum-based plastics that have the infrastructure in place 
It's been in place for decades. People are familiar with it. They know like, hey, this works. This works for me. I'm going to keep using it. It's cost effective, I whatever. So that's what we're competing against. And we have this really kind of nascent-ish industry that doesn't have all of those things. So that's another area that we have been putting some focus on too is one, how can we kind of support bringing products to scale, that commercialization. We're actually launching our own kind of speaker series, and that's the topic of the first event. It'll be later this month. That's the first topic is like how, what's what's happening in that space, helping to bring those products um, from kind of lab to, to commercialization and some of the organizations that are, that are focused on, on that. So that's definitely a topic of interest within the organization. And then the other one you talked about was the sort of cost issue, but Well, we think about all of the sort of subsidies and other sort of benefits that are out there for the petroleum industry that they're sort of benefiting from, but also thinking about sort of parallel industries to ours, like sustainable aviation fuel or wind or solar. Like this is all about moving to renewables. Like in those cases, it's energy or fuel, but like we're just talking about products and the various incentives and and other sort of programs that have been put in place to help kind of grow those industries. Because similarly, like the benefits are there. Like you can see, like we should be moving to more renewable energy, right? And more renewable fuels. But we need a, a parallel effort when it comes to products. And so thinking about what we can learn from those other industries and if we can create some similar sort of programs that can help our industry get off the ground so to help kind of address that cost disparity that's out there right now. You know, we'd like cost to not be as much of a factor so that so that when someone's looking at a bio-based product versus a conventional product, the cost is not as much of a factor. Now I recognize there's there is a little bit of interest in in sort of expectation from consumers and, and data that we recently conducted showed that people are willing to pay a little more, maybe a little more, you know, um, maybe not a lot more, but there is a little bit more willingness and expectation that if it's a more sustainable product, it might cost a little bit more. Um, and I'm willing to pay that because I see the benefits of it, but there's still work to be done to to address that cost disparity. So that, again, that's what we've kind of been, been thinking about is how can we as an industry work with policymakers to try to identify some opportunities to help take costs off the table. You know, you're looking at how does it perform and what are the benefits? Like, what is the true cost, right? Like, what is the true cost of our products versus a petroleum-based product if we're using something renewable and looking across the life cycle of those products to see, like, what is the true cost? And that, that should be taken into consideration. I think you and I as consumers cannot, we can just say we want more compostable products, but we are not in charge of what we get and we can decide whether we, what we can do. But when I speak to customers, General Mills and the Unilevers of the world, who will actually more or less govern what happens because that's where the decision-making happens. It's two things and you've mentioned uh, both in a way. So, so the one factor is of performance and the other is, you know, like who does it first and who is going to be the leader to increase their cost. I'm sure you are faced with these questions also in terms of performance and price and how do you tackle it when, if you, as, as the council, are also uh, talking to customers. You know, it's, it's interesting. I feel like when I first started in this role a couple of years ago, you heard more about plant-based packaging, which might have a little bit of a higher cost. Should be being used in more like niche applications, like where it might be a more expensive product that's being sold in the first place. So like a little bit of an increased cost in the packaging, like maybe they can kind of get away with that. But now we're starting to see it more mainstream. You know, you're seeing like Skittles, you know, and you're seeing like McDonald's trying out cups and like it's bigger, like it's big time. And so that's what we need. We need those big CPGs to play that kind of leadership role to help bring the cost down, like that helps too, right? The more we can help sort of expand the industry can help kind of address some of that. I mean, I think it's positive to see more of that becoming more mainstream. Yeah, I mean, the performance is is critical too. And 
I mean, there's constant innovation happening, right? Like we know performance is critical. And I guess, you know, some have questioned like, well, are we over engineering a little bit on on performance? And can we give a little bit because we we just over engineer so much? And and if it's consumers expectations on shelf life or what have you, but maybe there's a, a little bit of give there that can be considered, um, especially if you're trying to address environmental concerns at the same time. If you can help the environment and, and give a little on performance that you might find a, a you know, a middle ground. Want to be a part of the next big thing in the compostable packaging space? Check out gcahub.com. G-C-A-H-U-B dot com. Create your free account and connect with others in the sustainable packaging industry. On GCA Hub, you can exchange ideas, network, solutions, problems, and learn through curated resources. Let's connect for impact. Now, let's get back to the conversation. So now switching gears to policy and towards composting. So it's always a chicken and egg story, right? Even if you produce compostable products, where does it go? Because there are not enough composters. And then, uh, you know, the, the composters have their own kind of challenges and stories. Where is the inflection point and how does it, uh, how do you see it changing and how does policy play into that? We certainly hear that, that sort of concern, right? Like, well, if I use compostable packaging, but it's not going to a composter, like that's kind of greenwashing, right? And I don't want to be seen as greenwashing. And I get that. And so I think it all, it all needs to be moving. Like this isn't a one or the other. Everything can be worked on. Like we can work on improving the packaging. We can work on improving the infrastructure. We can work on, you know, addressing concerns that composters have about taking this and it all needs to be happening, you know, moving together. I'm, I'm glad that we have this great relationship with BPI and others to, to sort of work together on these, because this is one of the, the challenges. You have a lot of interests who are who see the benefit of, of composting and want more composting, want more compostable packaging, but trying to make sure that because there's so much happening that we're all coordinating and that we're all addressing the the various concerns that that need to be addressed. So, you know, I think the coordination is a critical piece of it across the industry because you have many different players who all have this the same interests in mind. And how do we make sure that resources are being put where they need to be put? From our standpoint, you know, the the policy piece as you know being in DC It was interesting, like working with this sort of broader coalition, um, the U.S. Composting Infrastructure Coalition, we we launched last year to try to get more focus on composting infrastructure. We got legislation introduced in in the U.S. House and Senate called the Compost Act. It would have set up a USDA led composting like funding program, grants and, and loan guarantees. It's difficult to get a new USDA program set up, but what it did was really open the door for having discussions on the Hill and with the administration about composting. So I think a lot of policymakers are just, they're not as familiar with composting, what it is. But once you start talking about it, they really see the benefits and and what we were excited about now, there's some legislation that was introduced called the Recycling and Composting Accountability Act. So to see recycling and composting in the same bill, like to see those being talked about at the same time, I think we're, we're making some progress here on a policy standpoint that those are seen as opportunities to improve our waste management system. And they both play a role um, and that can work sort of hand in hand. So we're glad that those conversations are happening more and more now, and there's more of a recognition on the benefits that that composting can play. And uh, I see it in many countries that there's not enough demand for compost because everybody's still using a lot of chemical fertilizers. They're not doing enough soil enhancement. And that's a challenge that the composters, is, of course, you know better than me, it's a more complicated puzzle. So do you also combine efforts with people trying to do more soil enhancement kind of idea so that there's a bigger market for composters? Yeah, and, and that's come up as well. That was one of the things we were trying to to address in part with that that bill that we got introduced last year. It would have you could have used funding to help develop kind of marketing 
programs for finished compost. But we've also been thinking a little bit about like what our reach is, but like what's the role the federal government can play in that if it's, you know, getting more compost products in federal transportation projects and at national parks, like just thinking about the ways ways the federal government can kind of play a leadership role and in, in helping to drive markets for finished compost. So I guess sort of thinking about what's in, like what we we have control over our, our kind of reach, but um, that's one thing we've been talking a bit about is, you know, that sort of federal government leadership role. And there's been a couple executive orders that have come out lately on sustainability. And there was one just last month on bioeconomy. So there's sort of this kind of recognition around sustainability. And and so it's sort of trying to take advantage of those executive orders to open up continued conversation about compost and the federal government's role in supporting that industry. Yeah, that's wonderful. So coming to federal versus state, how much of a challenge is that? So how does that play? And do you just work equally with many states or do you see which ones are more receptive and work with them to help them form their policy? How does that work? Yeah, we're pretty focused in in D.C. at the federal level. And to get engaged at the state level can take a lot of resources. But we're at an interesting time right now. We're coming up on the midterm elections, and that could change control of Congress. And what you often see is when there's not sort of uniformity in in the parties at Congress and the administration is that you may see some things not moving, but at the, then where the movement starts happening is at the state level. And so we've been thinking that through and what that might present as opportunities. Now, engaging at the state level can take a lot of resources. Um, and so would definitely have to think about where are the best places to play? Like, where can we have a significant impact? Or how can we sort of work, you know, develop if it's model legislation that we can kind of share with multiple states? So thinking about how we can strategically engage at the state level, if that might be the the place where there's a little more activity happening on environmental issues after the election. But we'll see what happens next month. Best of luck. <laughs> I was I was listening to your wonderful presentation and you talked a lot about data and let's pivot here towards data and it was fascinating. One of the data that you presented was people didn't know where plastic came from. I would love for you to throw more light into the kind of data that comes and how does how that influences your work because I know a big part of your work is education and 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 basically making the consumer awareness higher. Yeah, yeah. And that data point that you're referring to, that was some consumer research focused on millennials. And I want to say it was 2018 that was conducted. So not that long ago, asking about what plastic was made out of. And uh, I think it was about a quarter of respondents picked plastic root as the as the response, which is just... It's interesting. So, um, so we have we have a lot of work to do to help people understand the products that they use. What are they made from? What is the environmental impact that they have? Not just in how they dispose of it, but what it's made out of. So we just now just finished our third year of our consumer research that we conduct every year. I mean, it's interesting times to be doing consumer research. Like this has all been done in the pandemic. So there's obviously a lot of other things on on consumers' minds. But we do continue to see like incremental increase in people saying they are aware of these products and that they're trying them out. We saw, I think it was like a 9% increase from last year and people saying they're trying out plant-based products. So that's exciting to see that there's a little more kind of awareness and that people are trying them out. And that's that's where you need to start, right? Like get these products in people's hands so they kind of know what are they, what how do they perform? Like this is going to meet the needs that I have for these products. So it's exciting to see that whether it's us or, or the broader industry is having a having a bit of an impact on consumers and their awareness is they're thinking about, you know, wanting more sustainable products that something plant-based is, you know, an option there. Yeah, because the other piece of data, which I clearly remember, was 82% of Americans knew about plant-based products, which is which is pretty much in line with what you're saying. And that's that's pretty big. But do you do you also see uh, like a antipathy? So some people say, no, I don't really want plant-based products. Do you see that happening as well? So uh, one thing that we do hear, and this I think goes back to sort of when ethanol was started to become a thing, that there's concern around, well, if 
we are making products out of plants, like can we continue to feed a growing population? That's this sort of question that that we often get. And the reality is that the amount of like, this is an exciting industry, but it's really small. <laughs> it's really small right now. It's like 1% to 2% of all plastic is bioplastic. And the impact that the amount of ag land that's used to, to produce these products is a fraction of a fraction of a percent. It's, you know, 0.00, I get a number off the top of my head, but it's it's a very small amount. And And helping to understand, I mean, this sort of goes back to like, what we're trying to address on the the food waste aspect is like how much food is wasted and the inefficiencies in our global systems to get food in the hands of people that need it. It isn't necessarily um, that, you know, we don't have enough. It's like how much is wasted and, and obviously location dependent. But at least here in the U.S., there's a lot of a lot of food that gets wasted. So improving the the efficiencies of those systems while at the same time recognizing there's a lot of diversity in the feedstocks that can be used. Even ag waste materials can be used to make products. Like I talked about those sort of more innovative feedstocks. So thinking about the diversity there and and that we can continue to feed people while making more sustainable products. And when you look at consumer education as a council, it needs a certain amount of funding to be able to really go broad based in order to be able to put the word out there and you know get on to deep social media television or what have you are there things that you're doing there in order to be able to widen the education across the spectrum I mean I would say our primary audience is policymakers but I would say the you know the level of understanding that many policymakers have about plant-based products is probably similar to most consumers so you know most of the materials we put together will will also appeal to a consumer audience we don't necessarily at this time have the funding to do you know big broad consumer education maybe we'll get there at some point but right now i would say our primary audience is policymakers but i think anyone can go onto our website and look at you know our blog posts and other things that are sort of educational about plant-based products and can understand and can learn because it's all you know aimed at a more general audience what about things like labeling and identification? Are you working with PPI or on your own on uh, things like that? Because that's really important as well when you get to segregation and compostability in particular. Yeah, I mean, I would say when it comes to the end of life, sort of the labeling around compostability, we we definitely defer to BPI um, and support the work that they do there. The other area, though, I we put some focus on is with the USDA, U.S. Department of Agriculture. They have a program called BioPreferred, and that program has a consumer-facing label that companies can um, can voluntarily you know sign up to be able to use that shows the bio-based content of the product or their packaging. The program isn't really well known. I mean, I don't think most consumers have, have seen that label or are out looking for that label when they're shopping. So that's a, a program that we're, it has a lot of promise, but it needs more funding and some other things to help kind of improve that program. The other aspect of it is federal procurement. It's supposed to drive federal procurement of bio-based products. So kind of like we were talking about with, you know, the federal government playing a, a leadership role in, in compost purchasing, but also playing a a leadership role in in purchasing bio-based products. So there's some efforts we're looking at with the 2023 Farm Bill, which work is sort of getting underway on that right now. That's the the sort of uh, legislation that says, here's what you'll do, USDA, um, to see how we can help kind of improve that program, both the procurement side, but also the consumer-facing label. And hopefully with some more funding, they can help kind of get the word out about that label so that it is something that consumers are looking for. And they understand when I see this, like what that means and that this is a bio-based product. And that's something I'm looking for in, in the market. You also spoke, and this was really interesting uh, for me, about building a product database and, and, you know, so that people can come and find products and at least your member companies. Or are you looking at it as a broader base, member and not member? Because that, again, helps the customer to be able to find uh, uh, products, which could be alternates that they could use. Talk to us about that. Talk to us about how you're envisioning that and how big do you want to see that become? Yeah, we do have a database on our website um, that has member and non-member products. Really, anyone can reach out to us to get added to that database. We've also done a little bit of work recently. There's sort of a new feature on our website that's just trying to 
help people understand the breadth and depth of plant-based products. So broken down by different industries, like here are different applications in agriculture and building and construction or toys, like, you know, so you can kind of see that. You know, I'd also point to that USDA BioPreferred program. They have a, a database as well. I think it has, I want to say 17,000 products. Like it's pretty substantial. And those are products that have all kind of, you know, gone through their um, program to get added to their catalog. It's one of the things I'm hoping to do with uh, with some improvements to that program is, you know, maybe uh, improving that uh, that database that USDA maintains a little bit more so that it is a little more user-friendly, but having a, a solid resource that consumers are like, hey, I want to buy this. Let me go and see who who makes a bio-based version of that. And, and so I can try to purchase that. Because right now the USDA catalog, I think has 139 categories, but there could be a lot more. I guess one of the, the sort of challenges we see with that program and one of the other sort of aspects we'd like to see improved is that each category has a minimum bio-based content, but there's not an effort to sort of update that. And we'd love to see that really driving innovation, like driving increased bio-based content. And so there should be sort of a regular review of like, what's the current technology and should the minimum required content to be listed be higher? Because if it's achievable, it should be helping to sort of drive innovation um, and drive increased bio-based content. So that's one of the aspects that we're we're hoping to improve in that program. So it's more helping to, to move the industry, not just having a minimum and whoever's above it. Like if someone has a product that's, you know, 75% bio-based, like they're listed right alongside someone who has a product that's right at the minimum. Let's say it's 25, you know, I'm just using an example, but shouldn't the 75% product have some preferential treatment or like, shouldn't we be driving more toward that if we know it's possible? So one of the questions I asked Rhodes is one of the challenges of PFAS. And, you know, it's such a big deal in U.S., uh, whereas on the rest of the world, it's not a huge thing. So I actually pushed Rhodes a little bit and he said, I just have to be careful. I cannot have anybody point fingers on the compostable product. So what is your thinking on, on the PFAS issue and why has it become such a big thing in U.S. and not Europe and not the rest of the world? Maybe it's coming, but it's not there yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think there's maybe a little bit in Europe, but so I will say in full disclosure, I, my previous position was that I was the executive director of the Fluoro Council, which is representing the PFAS manufacturer. So have maybe a little bit of a different take on it. But, you know, the reality right now is that there's concerns. People are just concerned. And of course, anyone's going to be concerned when they find a chemical that has been associated with negative health effects in a product they're using, in a product their child is using, in the water that they're drinking, and that's understandable. I think the the work that's being done to identify alternatives that don't have PFAS intentionally added to it is that's the way of the future. I mean, that's the way things are going. And and this increased attention on the issue, that's not, that's not going away, is it? You know, that's just continuing. And so making sure that, I mean, that's really the priority that consumers are feel like the products they're using are safe, that they have confidence in what they're using and in the regulatory review process that those products have been subjected to. If it's FDA or EPA, you know, making sure that those processes are, are thorough and, and are ensuring safety of the products that are on the market. So I want to hear your Floro insight as well, since you have that insight, because I'm sure they had their own thinking in terms of the fluorochemical industry. What was their, what was their point of view? How would they see this issue? Yeah, I mean, that was an industry that they had, had used PFOA and PFOS and, and phased those chemicals out and moved to, to alternatives and have data that's been developed to, to support those alternatives. And that's really what a lot of that industry is, is sort of pointing to. I think one of the other challenges that that industry faces is that when we talk about PFAS, it's not like one chemical or, you know, 10 chemicals that are all the same. It's like a wide variety of chemicals. And some of them are very different from others. And they're sort of being talked about as like one uniform, like these are just 10 different flavors of cake, whereas like it's not really, maybe there's 10 different flavors of cake, but then there's like some 
stakes over here. Like they're just totally different. And so making sure that the regulation addressing concerns around those chemicals is based on the science that supports like what's actually being regulated and that like you don't need to regulate some the same way you regulate others because they're just so different and that's a real challenge that that industry faces. That's interesting. So giving some future thought, uh, what is your ideal situation when you look at uh, the plant-based products council or in general the, the this work going forward say in a five-year, ten-year horizon what is the kind of world that you see? What is your ideal state? Well, ideally, there'd be a lot more plant-based products in the market. Um, but but I think in, in the shorter term, like in the next few years, working on those programs, the education, the, the policies that are going to help support that growth, because it's not necessarily going to happen on its own, but you know, seeing commitments from from companies around moving to this more sustainable products, recognizing those benefits, but having the policies, like getting movement on the policies and programs that will help support industry growth so that we can see a, a broader sort of inundation of, of plant-based products in the market so that we're really realizing the benefits of the products. So most of our listeners are typically people in the polymer packaging, students in the material science kind of uh, world. Is there something that you would like to communicate to them from your point of view on what they should be looking at or doing? Yeah, I mean, this is a, an area that I hope that students are interested in. You know, I, I think there's a lot of opportunity here and a lot of opportunity for innovations. Like we've talked about some of the challenges that this industry faces, and we're not going to tackle those without the scientists and the, you know, the engineers that are helping to support that innovation to create the next packaging 10.0 or whatever that's going to meet all of these challenges that that we face or address all those challenges. So we've done some research trying to figure out like who's who's educating the future workforce here? Like this is needed and and we hope that people see this as an opportunity to do some be on the kind of the cusp of the cutting edge industry if you will. So maybe that's my message. <laughs> No, and you'd be happy to know there's a lot of uh, youngsters, at least wherever we go in the overall in sustainability. I think there's such a strong uh, sense of uh, doing right by the planet that is in this generation. So, of course, uh, moving towards my last question, uh, which is what does good garbage mean to you? I think to me, good garbage continues to provide, if you will, if it's turning into another product or we talked about compost and the benefits that compost provides. I mean, we're all about the circular economy. So whether it's, you know, changing it into something else that continues to provide some value, I, I guess to me, good garbage continues to continues to provide, I guess. That's very succinctly put. Continues to provide. I like that. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you for your time. Thank you for joining in and for illuminating you know, the ideas that you have around plant-based products and composting. It's been a great honor to host you. Thank you for your time. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. It's been great chatting with you. Thank you for listening to the Good Garbage Podcast. Follow us on social media to never miss an episode. Links are in the description below. I'm your host, Ved Krishna. See you next time.